Welcome everyone, you found Sanctuary's Coffee and Conversation Show. My name is Myrna Haskell. I'm executive editor of Sanctuary Magazine. This is an online publication for women that empowers and inspires with a focus on the arts, philanthropy, health and wellness, culture and community. You can find us at sanctuary-magazine.com. This morning, my guest is Dr. Carla Manley. She is a psychologist, a relationships expert, and an author, and she also happens to be an expert panelist for Sanctuary Magazine. Thank you so much for joining me today, Carla. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Myrna. And you were wonderful the last time you were on this program, and I think some of the listeners today probably recognize you because your book, Date Smart, was excerpted in Sanctuary last year, so folks can find that in our book excerpt section. And you also participated in our interactive section, Ask an Expert, so that was really terrific, too. So you'll see Carla here and there throughout because she's an important part of our community. But today we're going to talk about how attachment style affects adult relationships. So I know there's some folks out there, Carla, that are going, hmm, attachment style, what's that? So I kind of wanted to start out with you explaining what that is, and then perhaps sharing with us if there's different types of attachment styles. Absolutely. So attachment style, and some people might hear it now in more current form as attachment parenting, but really what attachment style is, when we are children, from the time we're born, the way we learn to interact with other people begins with our caregivers and our caregivers aren't always our parents. So often when you hear attach, when we're talking about attachment, you'll hear the word caregiver because we want to be very inclusive. So as a parent interacts with a child, if a parent is attuned most of the time, it's what is called good enough parenting, right? Where they're attuned most of the time. 80% of the time, because we all miss the mark sometimes with our kids, then the child really, and we're talking attunement, let me explain attunement. It means when the child yawns, you go, oh, baby's tired. Child cries, oh, baby's hungry, let me give baby food. Baby smiles, we smile back. And then as baby grows older, baby throws a toy and we pick up the toy and say, uh-oh, and give the toy back. And so the child is seeing that what I do, my parent attunes to me, my caregiver. I matter, right? The child learns that I matter. Somebody's noticing my needs and meeting my needs in healthy ways. That is attunement. When we have that in an ongoing way in a childhood relationship with a caregiver, the child has an internal sense of security. I am safe, I am seen, I am loved. Somebody's tuning into me. So that's the ideal place. And that's ideally how we raise our children. Right. But many parents parent, and this is not about blaming anybody. So we don't want to go into that shame or blame place. We've all... Because you know, parenting is the hardest thing in the world, oh, too, isn't it? It is so hard. And nobody gives us a manual for it. And even, That's right. <laughs> even if we do have a manual for it because we picked up the latest parenting book, often that advice doesn't necessarily work with our child. But right, you're flying by the seat of your pants. Half you're the time, flying right? by the yeah. seat of your pants. <laughs> and you're often juggling in a, in a perfect snow globe world, you're able just to tend to baby and that's it. And that's your only job. And you're, you know, have no mental health right. issues and, and your partner is right there and the go-to person, you don't have financial stressors, but that's not real life. Real life is filled with a lot of stressors. So we have seen, and this, the, the understanding of attachment started in the 1950s, and it actually began with Harlow's monkey, monkey Studies. So I don't want to go a lot into the science of it, but that's where it started, where there was this new belief, because parenting before was like, oh, these, these are just little adults, and let's just tend to them as we can and just drag them along in life. And there was even the concept of children don't need hugs. Children shouldn't have kisses because that's being too doting on them. And we don't want to dote on a child or spoil a child. So it was actually Harlow's monkey studies that set us up for an understanding of how important attachment is. Touch, attunement, 
eye to eye contact. For, it makes sense. Yeah. Oh, for socialization, for brain development, for character development. And then we had some researchers, uh, John Bowlby and Donald Winnicott, who came, ar- came along and really fostered our understanding of the importance of a healthy, secure childhood environment. And then we had people come along like Mary Ainsworth, who really dove into attachment research. So listeners, and I'll stop the the psychobabble in just a second, but just so you know, this is one of the most well-researched areas of psychology. Okay. Because these studies that started in the late 50s, 60s have carried forward. So we see that this actually plays out in life. How does it play out? Because if I have a securely attached attachment style and you have a securely attachment style and we meet and create a relationship, then we will both feel secure and it will generally be a successful relationship. However, if you are one of those many people who does not have a secure attachment style through no fault of your own, it's just what happened in your childhood environment. Maybe you had one parent who was secure and the other one who was a an alcoholic. Well, that certainly adds a lot right. to, to, to the situation. So what will happen, and we can dive into this more and I'll let you ask me a question, but we see that the secure or insecure, so there's secure attachment and there's insecure. Insecure has three styles under that umbrella. And so that's where we want to start looking at what happens. Secure, secure is easy. And secure can generally get along with any of the insecure styles, but it will, be of, it will be a lot of work for the secure person because that secure person will always tr- be trying to be the home base for the insecure types. And it can be very exhausting, right? And of course, all of this occurs on a continuum. So you can have someone who's extremely secure and someone who's mildly secure, somebody who's very insecure attachment style or moderately insecure. You can also have a mixture of the three insecure attachment styles. So it's important to realize that none of this is set in stone, that you, in fact, people love taking the online tests for attachment styles. And the caveat for that is you may not want to put a whole lot of faith in the answers because if you're taking those online quizzes and often they will get you in at the end and they're basically asking you to pay for something and you don't know the research behind them. So if you take an online test, just take it the results with a grain of salt right, right. because if you take it on a day where you're feeling really great, your mental health feels really strong. It's going to affect your answers. Right? It'll affect your answers. Yeah. And if you take one a day after you and your partner have a big blowout and you feel unloved and you're going to have different answers right and that's how tests that are not well designed work the results okay. are predicted that's important to let listeners know very Thank important you. you know what carla i know we're talking a lot about childhood and pa- parenting and and you know a baby from the get go feeling secure and loved and all of that but can we talk a little bit about the dynamics of childhood attachment style and whether or not that morphs or changes at all as we become adults is there a different uh, you know does it does it is it a different thing or a different animal once we become an adult or do we carry that same attachment style i guess you know all the way through It's such a good question. So childhood, and it's important to realize too, that the terms change from childhood attachment style to adult attachment style. Okay. So in when you're reading, and just a quick note, my next book um, really dives, it's which comes out in early 2024, really dives into what I'm talking about today so that people have a basic understanding of how this looks throughout life. And um, so that's why I, I really became very conversant on it because partly it's my training, but also I want people to understand that a lot of what's out there on the internet is very confusing. Right. So they're using childhood attachment styles for adult relationships. So okay. if somebody goes and looks at terms I'm talking about, they'll think, well, this is slightly different. And that's because people are just ad-libbing it as they go along. So okay. to more specifically answer your question, a childhood attachment style is generally formed by, you know, age three, four, five. 
it's really cemented by age 17, okay. really cemented by the time a child reaches early, early adulthood. And can now, can that change? Absolutely. If you have a secure attachment style and you are really walloped by bad relationship after bad relationship or trauma after trauma, you can absolutely, your style can absolutely shift. It generally remains the same, but we do have to throw that in. Okay. If you are one of the insecure attachment styles, your style can definitely shift through psychotherapy and listeners, you will love this piece, through a healthy relationship. Because if you're blessed enough to, let's say you have two insecure people who come together and say, and they say, we really want to mindfully create a healthy relationship. That actual real life experience of two people tuning into each other, making mistakes, repairing the mistakes, really working. You can see how it in a, in a most beautiful way can take the childhood wounds, allow two adults to work on them consciously in the present and actually shift their attachment style into. Well, that's good to hear. Yes. That's very good to hear. Yes. <laughs> that's yes. a positive for sure. It right? is very but it does, but you do have to have a really good self-awareness, I think as well for that, right? incredible self-awareness and again it's the nature of the work I do and the nature of my books to help people get that self-awareness because just reading a self-help book or going to therapy won't necessarily do that you have to take that awareness and work it and work it and ideally work it in an actual relationship okay that's where we can really learn and grow I understand. I understand. I think that, thank you for explaining that so clearly. You know, I'm wondering if we can segue a little bit into then how these attachment styles like directly affect our behaviors in our adult relationships. Like what happens with those behaviors, I guess, if you can just like dig in a little bit there. Absolutely. And this chart shows the difference between adult attachment style terminology and childhood attachment style terminology. Okay. So what you see is in childhood, the styles secure stays the same. In childhood, we have secure attachment and then we have avoidant, we have ambivalent, sometimes called resistant, and we have disorganized, sometimes called unclassified. Those styles, the characteristics tend to stay the same. The person matures, but in, of course, but in the um, adult relationship, those childhood wounds in an intimate relationship will manifest. Okay. And that's the piece we want to remember when we're talking attachment. You can have a very high functioning businessman or businesswoman who looks absolutely secure and confident. You get them in an intimate relationship. And if they have an insecure style, that's where it will manifest. Okay. So that's important to know. You can have... Um, you, so, so that's important to know. So in adult styles, right? So in the childhood, remember, we have secure, avoidant, ambivalent, and we have disorganized. Okay. In adult, we have secure, dismissing, preoccupied, which is often called anxious, but in, in literature, it's called preoccupied. And then we have unresolved. And where you tend, so those are the styles, again, listeners, here's Here's one more look at my little chart that I, I use in, in my presentations. Now, when we look, and I'll have a, here's another chart that this one is all about the adult styles, the secure, the dismissing, the, pre the preoccupied. Remember, you'll often hear preoccupied called anxious. Okay. And then we have unresolved. So the way those play out is very similar in adulthood and childhood, only we have to think that the child is, you know, showing it in different ways. So for example, in childhood, the securely attached child will, mom will leave the room and the child will be like, oh, mom's gone, and then go and start playing with other people. 
you know, other friends making fame. When mom returns, the child will have a healthy response. Like, oh, mom, I love you. Okay, you're back. Hug, hug, kiss, kiss. So it's that same sort of thing with the other attachment styles that we, the, um, so I don't want to stay too much in childhood, but you can get an, an, an imagining of what it would be like with a child who is, has disorganized attachment. The mom leaves the room the child may have an absolute fit, an absolute meltdown, or the child may turn away and like, I don't care. And then when mom returns, and then the child will be aloof with other children and not play with the other children. The child will be, mm, I don't, don't want that. And then when the mom gets back, the child may run away from the mom. The child may hit at the mom. The child may do any variety of behaviors that show I am not attached to this person. I don't want to be attached to this person. And so again, in adulthood, so let's move. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. Can you give an example of how that okay. would manifest in an adult a relationship? Okay. So in an adult relationship, I'll move through the styles. The securely attached adult will generally, especially if they high, have high emotional intelligence, and the two tend to go together, but not always. You can have somebody who's securely attached who just hasn't really worked on exploring and amplifying their emotional intelligence. So in a healthy, healthily securely attached adult, you will see the person saying, hey, I like you. I'm interested in you. Will you go out on a date with me? They will work through the hiccups in a relationship. They will stay constant. They will be clear on their needs. They'll be respectful of the other person's needs. They will tune into the other person's needs. They'll ask the other person to tune into their needs. There will be a lot of reciprocity, a lot of conversation, a lot of healthy back and forth. Stability. The same stability and attunement they were given as a child. Makes sense. Okay. So when we have the dismissing child, or I'm sorry, the, the dismissing adult attachment style, I like to call these, um, because you see it on the internet quite a lot, and it, it describes them very well, the lone wolf type. This okay. is not, this is different from a loner. This is a lone wolf type, the independent soul who says, yeah, I don't really need you. I might be in relationship with you, but I don't really need you. I'm fine on my own. I don't really care if you're here or not. Um, and that person, when we see relationship styles, that person tends to have, there are four relationship styles that I use in my work, and they are parallel paths, two people who are basically like roommates, divergent okay. paths, two people who are in a relationship, but they're just boom, off in their own worlds. <laughs> then we have the entangled paths, which are like this, and they're very enmeshed and then we have what i call the fluid path in and out they have their separate worlds they come together they have their separate worlds that come together with and so with that background we can see that the person with the dismissing attachment style it's like i don't need you i'm going to go my own way if you don't want to do what i want to do whatever if you're not and then if you have an insecure person on the other end that can oh, that nice. exacerbates it right oh you jumped straight into the firing pan yeah you have that is the one of the worst pairings when okay. you have that dismissing person and the what we call the um preoccupied person often called anxious it becomes like this. It's a chase. This person's leaving. This person's terrified and chases. And then it's this constant chase. And of course, who is it harder on? It's harder on the preoccupied person. It's harder on the anxious person because the um, dismissing person has created such a wall from childhood forward that I don't need you. I'm in this world alone. I don't really care. And of course, it's a wall, it's a defense mechanism. If you were able to get underneath that, you would see that it's different. So and the person maybe is afraid of being hurt. That's their role oh, to say, I don't need true. you, right? Er um, ergo, I, I won't be hurt if you leave me or it doesn't work out, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that style, the dismissing style, to, and if you have a dismissing with a dismissing person, and it's like, I don't need you. I don't need you. And so we, let's just live our separate lives or break up or or get together for sex every once in a while, whatever it is. But there's there a fear of vulnerability, a fear of connection. 
And then when you have dismissing with secure, it's just a lot of work for the secure person to keep saying, hey, come on, let's come back and connect. It's safe here. It's safe here. And you can eventually, if the person wants to work on shifting the attachment style, there has to be a desire. There has right. to be a very self-aware desire to work on it. Yes. Then if you have the dismissing style with the unresolved style, that's not a good match either because the unresolved person goes between dismissing and preoccupied. And so it's this, you know, almost a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of shift back and forth. It can be. So of course, very difficult on the unresolved person with the unresolved attachment style. Okay. You can, so, you know, yeah. I was going to ask you, um, Carla, but I think you've been covering it a little bit. So I'm wondering if we can just tighten it up a little bit, but I was going to ask you about specific styles that lead to healthy versus unhealthy relationships. And I think I've been listening closely to you explaining, and I love that you've been doing it this way, that, because there's two people in a relationship, right? So it's not just the one person and their style. It's it's how they're interacting with another person and what their attachment style may be. But I'm wondering if just in general, you can say, you know, what's, what's a style that has a lot more... Um, likelihood that that style is going to, even if the other person has issues, lead to healthy relationship and, and vice versa, I guess, unhealthy relationships, just to dig in a little bit more to the bottom line, healthy versus unhealthy relationship when it, okay. it when it has to do with attachment style. So first, as I've said before, I just want to emphasize it. The most important factor in a healthy relationship is the commitment to working on the relationship. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, working on the self, intrapersonal and interpersonal, right? And if you don't have that commitment, it doesn't really matter the attachment style because progress won't be made in here or in between the two Okay. People. Okay. So that's the first thing to know. But clearly... Secure, secure is always going to be the winner. Okay. Secure, secure with two people who are really invested in evolving, right? And that's what I call polishing the stone of who we are and polishing the stone of the relationship. To me, that's just the, the sublime space, the place. And is that the one that you explained, Carla, when you said, um, you know, coming in and out, obviously a healthy relationship means that it's okay that you have relationships outside of that relationship and you do some of your own things, but then you come back together in a healthy way. Um, is, is that type of, um, I guess, or map, I want to say, of how the relationship comes together and goes away and comes together and goes away, yes. a healthy map for two secure people? Because they're secure about their partner having successes outside of the relationship, having other relationships outside of the relationship, and then working together on supporting each other and being together when they're together. Am I on the right track sort of there? You are 100% on the right track. And thank you for bringing that up because that fluid style really tells us that even no matter, so secure people will naturally, I'll go to work, I'll come home, my partner will be here, everything will be safe. I'll go and do my artistic activity or my exercise or see my buddies and my partner, you know, so there's this trust. Yes. Trust. So there's this trust and also this flexibility. And so the lovely part about those four types of styles is that no matter what your relation, no matter what your attachment style is, you can always look at those four styles and say, this is what I want. This is what I want. Or this is going to be the repercussion, right? If I choose to not invest in my partner and we're going on divergent paths, we will ultimately end up on two different planets. And so when we look at those styles, it's a way to, for us to almost set a compass. For oh, I like that. Yes. yes. So no matter the relationship style, let's say that we have two people who are di very dismissing of each other and they're headed this way and they say, oh, but I have a visual in my head now. Now I have this visual. This is what I want to do more of. And then once you have that visual, then you can set the goals and the micro goals for your relationship to help you get there. 
So oh, that's, I cool. like that. You know what? That makes me feel good. And I, I'm sure others as well who are listening to this, Carla, because, you know, I was going to ask you about, and I think you've already answered, you know, if we have the power to change, like even if our initial attachment style was more negative in a way of how it was going to relate to adult relationship, if we are self-aware and we are aware of different styles and how we need to communicate in a relationship and how the other person is reacting to us as well, that we can, I, I think you had mentioned at 17, it's kind of solidified at that point, but there still is the power to change how we're reacting and involving ourselves with others though. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's a very positive message. I like that. Absolutely. And that's, the beauty of, again, the, the clinical work I do, but it's also why I wrote my upcoming book, so that people can actually have a roadmap of how to do this. How can I do this? How can I come from this place, whether you're securely attached and have a lot of dysfunctional patterns, or you're insecurely attached and you want to know what is this muck that I live in? Why am I constantly dismissing my partner? Why is my partner constantly dismissing me and I'm chasing after them, right? How can we, and to me, that is some of our biggest work on the planet, is taking our relationships and refining them. And Maybe. probably those people that get stuck in relationships that aren't working over and over and over again, you know how we can spot those patterns oh, sometimes yes. in friends oh, yeah. of ours and stuff. Um, those folks are the ones who haven't really dug into the self-awareness and realize what's going wrong. And they keep making mm -hmm. the same mistakes over and over again in other relationships, in future Absolutely. relationships, right? Absolutely. If we yeah. don't change who we are, our patterns, our way of thinking, then we can't change the dynamics in relationships. So it's mm -hmm. so much, you, you mentioned it early on in our discussion, it goes back to creating self-awareness. Yes. And once we become self-aware, then it becomes about instituting, you know, bringing that self-awareness into our dynamics. And sometimes we have a partner who's not game for that. Sometimes right. as we learn and change, a partner says, oh, no, I liked being on two, on these two separate paths. No, I'm not ready for this. You might be ready for vulnerability and connection. And that's often one of the biggest issues I work with with couples, where you have one partner who's really wanting emotional connection and the other one's saying, mm -hmm. no, I like it over here on my island. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> Uh, right. Listen, I'm, uh, I am I want to make sure because we're running out of time that you have a minute or two to talk about your services. But, you know, I, my mind has been tweaked. I'm excited about this new book coming out. So I'm hoping you might be able to excerpt it again in Sanctuary for us when it does come out. And I know listeners are hearing about it and will probably want to purchase it because it, you said it would be a roadmap for them on this particular subject. So let's, let's sort of plan on doing that. But I'm wondering if you want to let listeners know anything else about you and your services, Carla, or anything else you'd like to fill them in on today? Well, it's, you know, I just love what I do. I am a clinical psychologist. I work with clients in California. Of course, as with most clinicians, you know, our schedules are really packed. But if somebody reaches out to me from a different area, for example, I do like and, and really enjoy helping people find as good a fit as I can in their community. So um, in their state. So I please, if you feel like you can't find a good therapist, I will give it a go to, to oh, help. That's, that's kind I, of you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I get inquiries all the time and I, and it's just something I feel that's really important for me to do. Um, and I really believe in, remember if you, for so many people, they go to therapy or they pick up a self-help book and they think my life hasn't changed. I can't say this enough that you have to be doing the work in your own life. An hour in therapy a week or reading one self-help book, which is why my books, all of them, contain exercises because you have to do and so if you're picking up a self-help book book look for one that gives you exercises yes it's not just the, about reading it's about no, it's doing not about work. reading it's yeah. about implementing it if you're seeing a therapist if you feel up to it ask your therapist i give my clients homework right if they don't do it that's up to them but the way i figure is i don't want them dependent on me i want my clients to learn their lessons get their wings and go and fly yes 
right? And so it, it, if you're up for it, look for a therapist who will augment the work in the session with work on your own so that you can really maximize it because that's how we create change. So and I am just a big believer in our power to change. And so if, if listeners, if you're in therapy or want to be in therapy and you're not seeing speedy enough change, maybe start keeping a journal to help you see the micro changes that you make. And if you're not making really good progress in your therapy, you know, talk to your therapist about it. It might be time to shift therapists or simply to ask your therapist to go in a different direction with you. So remember, if you want your life to change, you have the power to make a change. You do. We all have the power. Um, for example, I'll just say very quickly, I grew up with far from secure attachment far from secure attachment. And I've really worked with concerted effort to create a, a much more secure attachment style. If I can do it, you can do it, listener. Oh, I love that, Carla. Thanks for leaving us with such a positive message. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you so much for joining me today. It's been um, a pleasure. I'd like to close as I always do by wishing all of our listeners and our readers good health, happiness, and continued inspiration. Thanks so much for joining us today.